Okay, we've got a great news story for you today. China's tech lash continues. They're shutting down companies. People are losing tens of billions of dollars. And one has to wonder, and we'll talk about today, what is China's endgame here? Why are they doing this? Tesla had an incredible Q2 earnings call reporting over a billion dollars in profit, and they can make over a million cars a year now. That's just mind blowing being a, a Tesla super fan for all these years as a, as a customer. Additionally, uh, we, we keep covering this tether story. Uh, yesterday, $300 million flowed out of tether to uh, circle another stable coin. Is this the end of tether? After their Department of Justice investigation was announced, it's not looking good for tether. I got some insights into what you should do if you hold crypto on an offshore account or if you're on tethers. Finally, we found a pump and dump group on telegram with 3 million people in it pumping uh, a bunch of worthless coins. And I got some points to make there about pump and dump schemes. Are they legal? And if you are unaware of them, are you the sucker at the poker table? Stick with us. This Week in Startups is brought to you by Brainbase. Protecting your idea should be simple. Built by founders for founders, Brainbase File is a clean and automated trademark filing platform that gives anyone the ability to protect their idea. File now for just $169 at brainbase.com slash twist by using code twist. And... Odoo is a fully customizable and fully integrated suite of business apps that lets you build and scale your stack as you build and scale your business. Your first app is free forever, and right now, Odoo is offering $1,000 off your first implementation pack at odoo.com slash twist. That's O-D-O-O dot com slash twist. Okay, first up, China's tech lash continues. China, as you know, has been putting the screws to technology companies from Alibaba to ByteDance, the parent company of TikTok, then DD. It's been really wild to watch over the last couple of months, but I've known this has been coming for a long time. And I've been asked about this for many years and why I am such a hawk on China, why I think China is a sucker's game and that at some point, the Chinese government will change the rules on you. Well, in June 2016, I was being put under a lot of pressure for this belief that investing in China was a fool's errand and came with a lot of risk. Now, how much risk, how much of a fool's errand, we'll see, but it's not looking good right now. And I gave these comments to CNBC right around the time of uh, Alibaba, you know, coming to prominence and people being really excited about this incredible Google Amazon of China, and it was going to change everything. And uh, we should all pour our money into it. Here's what I said under fire under the firing line of having a very unpopular opinion at the time. I think that nobody has any real clarity on what's going on in China. Remember, this isn't even a democracy. And you have a company hanging out there, you know, sort of growing in, in a large way that the SEC is trying to figure out what's going on. So for any of us to try to pretend we know what's going on in China and with their economy, which has many thumbs on the scale and, and a lot of manipulation and a ton of corruption, and then try to understand what's going on inside of a company that's a high growth internet company, very hard to have any kind of transparency or, or insight into this company because um, it's kind of a black box China, right? And so I, I would be very careful owning stocks like these. Yeah, I wouldn't be comfortable owning anything in China in a, in a place where the government can round up, you know, the press and put them in jail for what they say. Uh, so yeah, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't feel comfortable owning the stock. I wouldn't feel comfortable operating in China. It's, it's a very challenged environment. You have to be a high risk investor. I would be very careful owning the stock. I would own it only under you know, a small, small, small percentage of uh, your, your, your overall diversified portfolio. Okay, so now that one, uh, I don't get them all right. But in this case, it's pretty clear to me that the rules can change. And uh, China, unlike our country, doesn't really have a judicial system where the companies get to debate or present their position. The Chinese government can change the rules at any time. And we were living under a mirage where we thought they wouldn't. We thought they would handle Hong Kong with, you know, a delicate hand. We thought they would, you know, be open to cultural products like our movies and music. And we thought they'd have an open mind to democracy and freedom of speech and newspapers. And it was all trending in the right direction. And that our great engagement, the great engagement of the past two decades, us investing in factories there, 
and creating the iPhone there, as well as them doing promotions with the NBA, our movies making their way into China. We thought all of this was heading in the right direction. And then we saw them trample over human rights in Hong Kong, put 3 million Uyghurs in jail, and start the great unraveling of their entrepreneurial movement. So we've covered the CCP crackdown for the last couple of weeks here as we move to doing a little bit of news before uh, we do interviews on the podcast. And so let's cover some of the moves. And really, today, Tencent, which is an incredible conglomerate in China that owns many different companies and has investments in many American companies, is now trading at $56 a share. It's down 20% over the past three days and down almost 50% from its February high of $99 a share. They've lost $150 billion in market cap over the past three days. Basically, they lost a, a Coinbase and an Airbnb in a couple of days in terms of market cap. It, it, this is a very serious situation. And it's tanking for a couple of reasons. Number one, the CCP ordered Tencent to end exclusive music licensing deals with record labels around the world, according to the BBC. So China is cracking down on Tencent's music rights monopoly, if you don't know, uh, and I didn't before I read the story, Tencent bought China Music Corporation in 2016, giving it the rights to more than 80% of all music tracks in the Chinese market. And according to China's State Administration of Market Regulation, every week we learn about a new governing body in China, this is called SAMR, SAMR, this was an unfair advantage over its rivals. Uh, and so thinking about that for a second, we're sitting here talking about the different frameworks for antitrust. We're having a grand debate about it over the last decade. Is big tech getting too big? Are they helping consumers? Are they hurting consumers? And is there any kind of angle to stop them from getting bigger? And it, is that in our best interest or not? We're having this like really vibrant debate across administrations, across political lines in the private sector, in the media. It's fantastic. We, it's a really vibrant democracy where you can debate these things, but not in China. From the BBC article, here's the quote, the company and its affiliated businesses have been told they can no longer engage in exclusive deals over music rights and must dissolve any existing agreements within 30 days. This would be the equivalent of our government, Biden, just saying, you know what? I'm going to send you know, the FTC, the FCC, whoever over to Google over to Apple and say, you know what, yeah, you can't put uh, Google flights at the top of your search results anymore. In fact, you can't have Google flights, just take it out of the product. Or going to Apple and saying, you know what, your deal with Google for exclusive search on Apple iPhones. Yeah, that's canceled. Uh, and it's got to be canceled within 30 days. There's no recourse here for these companies. The recourse is if you don't do it, you go to jail and get reeducated. That's basically what happens is you disappear. So for people who were scared about China as our adversary and our contemporary, and that really is the big picture, should we be concerned about this? Or should, is this actually a win for the West? I, in a way, think this is a win for the West because now China is saying, any success you have, we can take away from you. And I think that makes it uh, very untenable for investors from around the world to invest in China, which they've been coveting for a long time. So China's now taking away the ability for Americans to invest in these companies or anybody around the world, the Saudis, whoever, who wants to play in a casino where they can change the rules and all of a sudden queens are stronger than aces and aces are weaker than kings. I mean, they're basically just shuffled the deck and just changed all the rules. Uh, in addition to that, Tencent also has a large investment in the education industry in China, which is a booming space with lots of companies because the Chinese are so focused on education. Uh, and people are willing to pay for it. And uh, this Chinese education space has just been decimated. Uh, we started talking about this on Friday, the CCP is banning companies that teach school curriculum subjects from making profits, raising capital or listing on foreign stock exchanges. So let's pause for a second there. Imagine in America, we said, you know what, that test prep company, uh, or that after school Kumon, I think it's the after school uh, math classes or the Princeton Review uh, coaching you on your uh, GMATs or your SATs, all that now illegal. <laughs> you cannot make a profit from that. And any companies are now nonprofits. I mean, and then how do you unravel that? If these companies went public and they raised money from the private sector, do those people just lose their investment? What happens to all those assets? Maybe they bought a bunch of computers, they have cash in the bank. Do they buy the shares back and then shut down? There is no orderly process here. This is happening at an alarming pace. It's happening at an alarming pace. And the Chinese government is a really well thought out considered organization. 
they are thinking in centuries, not quarters. So they're throwing away massive amounts of wealth and influence on a global basis. Why? What is going on here? And that, that's really the question we need uh, to answer. Now, Tencent owns a 20% stake in this Chinese live touring app, uh, which is called Uan Fudao, which was valued at over 15 billion in October of 2020. Uan Fudao uh, had raised 4 billion from investors and Tencent stake is worth over 3 billion, or I should say was worth over 3 billion. Uh, and now it could be worth zero dollars. According to the Financial Times, other big players in China's education industry, BlackRock, Bally Gifford, Sequoia, China and SoftBank. They're all now I guess going to have to figure out what do they own and, and what are their LP zone. So speaking of SoftBank, they suffered a $4 billion loss on their DD position following the CCP removing DD from the App Store for a cyber security review. That meant that new users couldn't use the product. SoftBank owns 20% of DD and their stake was worth 12 billion at the time of the DD IPO. And after China's cybersecurity review and rumors of Didi's pending punishment, SoftBank stake is now worth $7 billion. So this is having ramifications. Now you have China and Saudi Arabia, which is the big backer of SoftBank. Now they are getting penalized for what's going on in Beijing and with Xi Jinping. Like, what's exactly happening here? This is going to result in a lot of phone calls from people whose bank accounts are being impacted and... China obviously knows that TikTok's parent company, ByteDance, they had recently hired 10,000 employees, according to the information, to work on education projects because it's such a huge opportunity. And now they are in danger of basically having to let those employees go or reassign them. According to the article, here's the quote, some ByteDance employees who work on the company's tutoring apps are already asking around for other job opportunities outside of education because of concerns that Beijing's crackdown could force many services to shut down. So plans uh, are changing fast in China, as I said in my piece from 2016, five years ago, it's a rigged casino, it's opaque, and you have no recourse. If you're betting over there, you're taking a lot of risk, you know that going in, it's kind of like going into a card game in, you know, Hollywood run by a bunch of CD characters, I used to get invited to these kind of crazy games, Molly's game, etc. And who knows if Molly's game was corrupt or not. I never played in it, but I was invited a bunch of times. It, who knows if people were playing from the same chip stack, right? You could have all of this collusion going on and you would never, ever know. And that is the challenge here. Uh, you're going into a market where there isn't the rule of law, where there isn't a legal system. Every startup needs to ensure they own their intellectual property or IP for short. And that starts with filing your trademark. I have been filing trademarks for 30 years. And I know what I'm talking about. It's one of those things that people forget to do or they put at the bottom of their list. And I understand that it's a pain in the neck, but it is not a pain in the neck anymore. If you don't know where to start, look no further than brain based file. It's a clean, simple and automated trademark filing platform that gives anybody the ability to protect their best ideas. There is no need to spend thousands of dollars on lawyers to file your trademark for you. No, now you can do everything yourself in just a few easy steps. Brain based file gives you goods and services recommendations using AI. So you can avoid the back and forth with the US Patent and Trademark Office, USPTO, and you can eliminate human error. They also offer full transparency into the USPTO process with step by step notifications and real time updates on your trademarks approval. This is a process folks. So save a ton of money, just head to brainbase.com slash twist and enter the code TWIST at checkout to file your first trademark now for just $169. That's a 15% discount. That's right, brainbase.com slash twist and enter the code twist at checkout to file your first trademark now for just $169. So Larry Chan, a Chinese education entrepreneur who was worth 15 billion in January has now lost over 90% of his net worth. He's now only worth 235 million, according to Bloomberg, boo hoo for him. But seriously, I mean, it's pretty crazy that somebody could have their entire fortune taken from them. And the way in which this happened is notable. Chen founded Gao Tu. Tichedo is uh, an education online tutoring company in China. Gautu went public in 2019 under the ticker symbol GOTU, and it hit a peak share price of $142 a share in January of 2021. Wow, so far so good. Amazing run, incredible company. From late January to July 21st, 
this past week, Gao to stock fell 90% to $11 a share. Now the six month downfall was fueled in part by Achego's capital losing 20 billion in two days in March. You remember we covered that on the all in episode number 28. They were trading billions on 5x leverage. In other words, they were trading $5 for every dollar, according to Bloomberg. And they were doing it in Chinese stock. So this is where the concern comes in and contagion and black swans start to enter people's minds. When you have leverage laid on top of an asset that is volatile, you get exponential leverage. An example of that might be what if you had a stable coin, and that stable coin was backed by bogus Chinese real estate paper, <laughs> just as one example, and maybe that, you know, stable coin, let's call it a tether, <laughs> had bad Chinese paper, and then you had two layers of fraud and or volatility occurring. None of this has been proven. Uh, buyer beware. Let's see where the chips fall. But that's an example of two things that are not stable being cross collateralized or otherwise mingled. We saw this in the financial market where people started selling uh, during the Great Recession, people started creating packages and bundles of mortgages that were subprime. And then people were making bets against and for a bunch of mortgages that probably should have never or certainly should have never been originated. They gave mortgages for expensive homes, the, the homes were overpriced, the mortgages were given to people who couldn't afford to pay for them. So you had an overpriced home, people couldn't afford to pay them and then people trading on top of that, you had layers of alerts and alarm bells going off. And here is another layer and alert of alarm bells going off. So Echegos had this highly levered position in Gao to uh, which they had to offload in giant blocks to provide collateral to the banks, which caused another large dip in March. And since China's education crackdown Friday, Gao to shares dropped another 70% to under $3 a share. So 141 to $3 a share now. So two huge drops. And it seems crazy when you've got a stock that's trading at 140 or a cryptocurrency trading at $60,000 to imagine it going down to but two or $3, right? To two or 3% of its initial value. But I have seen this movie before I have seen assets go to zero. I have seen all the equity holders wiped out many times in my career uh, with public companies. And certainly we see it all the time in private companies. So according to Bloomberg, Chen said Gao to and this is the quote will comply with the regulations and fulfill social responsibilities. Can you imagine an American CEO saying something like that? And for the good of our people, we will comply. I mean, this is crazy. I mean, in America, we'll say like, this is unfair, we're going to fight this, we will have our day in court, we'll take this all the way. Uh, we will fight this for the next decade. That is why America is such a great country. Now you may complain about wealth disparity capitalism running amok, unfairness in our judicial system, education system, and it could all be valid. But our system when compared to China is far superior because people have at least their day in court at least some recourse if the government becomes too heavy handed. In other words, you know, doing an executive order to take a bunch of stuff away in China looks very different than in America. In America, we might say, hey, you, you need to force people, you need to let people repair their own iPhones, and we, you have the right to fix stuff. And you can't put that in your terms of service. You know, Apple, people need to be able to repair their iPhones and third parties need to, this is a whole different level than saying, your company's gone, <laughs> you cannot make money in education. So this leads to the big question. Why is China doing this? And why are they doing it now? After this giant pandemic, which the West is probably starting to come to the realization that hmm, maybe this was engineered in a lab, maybe calling it the Wuhan virus is actually kind of accurate. I hate to give Trump any credit, but the lab was in Wuhan, as we know. And if it does turn out that they did accidentally leak it, I don't think they intentionally leaked it pretty accurate to call it the Wuhan virus. <laughs> I, I never really had a, too much of a problem with that except for, you know, maybe some spillover into obviously Asian hate where people might start blaming American uh, Asian Americans for that, which is actually super dangerous. The world's pretty complicated now. Bloomberg's opinion writer Noah Smith uh, had a good quote on a sub last week. He said China's leaders famously want to prevent 
the emergence of alternative centers of power. I agree with that. Jack Ma, obviously getting too powerful, ByteDance and uh, Tencent. These companies are getting really big and they have a lot of power, a lot of employees, a lot of cash. Uh, in that same article, Smith laid out an interesting argument uh, as to why China is smashing their own tech industry. He argues in America, we equate profit with value. And most American big tech companies are profit machines, right? Google, Facebook, Apple, print money, they've got huge coffers They're building up these giant piles of 10s of billions of dollars, hundreds of billions of dollars in cash in the case of Apple. Uh, but China uh, might see it differently. Here's the quote from Noah's piece. It's possible that the Chinese government has decided that the profits of companies like Alibaba and Tencent come more from rents than from actual value added. In other words, they are basically a tax on society. Uh, he's, he notes that China is still going all in on creating their own world class domestic semiconductor industry, compete with Taiwan and other places around the world and investing heavily in AI. Here's his quote, it's not technology that China is smashing. It's the consumer facing internet software companies that Americans tend to label tech. I would argue they are tech. Obviously, it's not hard tech. It's not, you know, building, you know, rocket ship engines or, or silicon or AI, you know, yeah, that's that's deeper tech, and it's harder tech. But it's still technology to build DD or Tencent or Alibaba or Amazon, there's still a lot of technology going on there. Uh, my take is different. I don't think it's that China sees the consumer facing stuff as frivolous, uh, and that semiconductors are more important. That might be true. Ultimately, if they are at war with the rest of the planet, and they want to take over planet Earth, and uh, or they just want to be ensured that they're the number one or number two player, which which country doesn't want to be the number one or number two global player, I think there's a lot of people who would like to be in that position. Uh, I think they want to secure the number one slot, and they want to secure their future and be protected from democracy the west etc they're they're taking their own plan i think what it is is it's not that the other things are more important even if they are more important it's that these companies have too much influence if you control the media if you have people's email addresses if you control their money supply with cryptocurrency or your apple pay equivalent or venmo equivalent you have undue influence over millions to hundreds of millions of people and you could challenge the government it's really that simple and we've seen that many times when they tried to shut Airbnb down in a number of cities, Airbnb used their user base to lobby local government officials, and they use their capital, obviously, to hire lobbyists, same thing with Uber, same thing with Google, big companies can actually go to their customers and say, Hey, de Blasio wants to lower the number of Ubers wait time is going to go up and Lyft. remember those messages they were sending or Uber and Lyft left Austin because they wanted to do a level of certification on ride sharing drivers as opposed to taxi and livery drivers that you know would have made the business untenable i guess uh for those companies i think they're seeing the power that corporations have in the west and they're saying heck no they're seeing the power that crypto has over economies including the dark you know sort of pulls the capital out out there underground economies like gambling uh, moving to crypto, money laundering, moving money around the world without paying taxes on it, without declaring it. China sees that. And China says, you know what? Too much risk for us, not for us. We're going to make our own digital currency. And these companies are too powerful. And certainly these entrepreneurs are too powerful. So they're going to take a break. And yeah, maybe they start another company or work on a nonprofit. It is super interesting that the United States can't even our government can't even control Amazon, Facebook, Twitter, and China is just shutting it all down. I think VCs, uh, you know, are have been correctly enamored. And it was a fine bet to make on China. But I do think if you're a venture capitalist in China, you're going to have to start or a media producer in China, those two areas specifically, you're gonna have to start wondering, what's the end game here, if all the companies that get to victory, then become shut down or worth 10% or 20% as much as they would have been worth in the West. Why are you even there? There's got to be other countries to work with. And this is what happens if you go to bed with a snake, and you get bit, you really shouldn't be sleeping with vipers. Period. End of story. How much time and money do you spend integrating a bunch of different software products together at your company? Let me guess way too much time. Well, Odoo is here to help. Odoo is a suite of business apps that runs your entire company on one platform. They'll streamline your workflow by bringing all of that information together. Plus, Odoo's integrations eliminate repetitive tasks and data entry. If you only need two or three apps to optimize your workflow, that's all you pay for. 
Odoo won't stick you with the bill for apps you don't use. Odoo has an app for every business need. They offer 30 main apps that are updated regularly and over 16,000 apps from their active open source community. You can keep your books tight with their financial software and their sales and CRM apps will help provide a clear and organized view of your business. So here is your call to action. Your first app is free forever. And right now, Odoo is offering a one thousand dollar credit on your first implementation pack that's not a joke that's a thousand dollars just go to odoo.com slash twist to check it out that's odoo.com slash twist next up tesla had an incredible q2 earnings report congratulations to the tesla team over a billion dollars in profit which is up 10x year over year from inside business tesla crushed its q2 earnings reported revenue of 12 billion dollars with automotive revenue of 10.2 billion up 28% from last quarter. And that's, that's not year over year. That's from last quarter. Tesla reported a net income of 1.1 billion, its highest so far. Uh, Tesla's Q2 2020 profit was 129 million on about 6 billion of revenue. So 1.7% uh, margin. So as you can see over time in Q2 of 2021, they made 1.1 billion on 12 billion. So 9.6% margin, and you'll probably continue to see that happen uh, over time, I would guess as they get scale, their operating margin more than five x in 12 months, pretty incredible. Uh, from the information, Tesla is becoming a cash machine so much so that Musk is continuing to ramp up CapEx levels while the company is still producing free cash flow. Tesla shares were up 1.5% after hours following a 2% rally during the day at this rate, Tesla shares still down nearly 7%. So far this year may soon make up the deficit for the year. So back in July, uh, Tesla had reported they delivered 201,000 electric vehicles and produced 206,000 in Q2 is just extraordinary. So analysts already had some indication what revenue would be uh, using sort of back of the envelope uh, math, their current capacity is 1.05 million vehicles a year spread between California and Shanghai, they are growing quickly, obviously, uh, over a multi year horizon, we expect to achieve 50% average annual growth in vehicle deliveries in some years we may grow faster which we expect to be the case in 2021 to achieve that tesla is building factories in texas and berlin uh obviously i think the texas one is for the cyber truck the core automotive business still accounts for the bulk of tesla's revenue but the energy business is growing from TechCrunch. tesla on monday reported 801 million in revenue from its energy generation and storage business which includes three main products solar its power wall storage device and homes and businesses uh, and it's utility storage unit mega pack. I've been looking at this mega pack because I was thinking about getting one for the house. You could really like, you could, they're big. They're like a bunch of power walls in one giant pack. Uh, and you're seeing office parks and even little towns and cities put them in. Revenue from this division grew 62% from the previous quarter, more than 116% from the same quarter in 2020. Uh, they don't break up solar versus energy storage. It's all the same thing for them, which makes sense. Moreover, the cost of revenue for its solar and energy storage business was 781, uh, 781 million, meaning that for the first time, the total cost of producing and distributing these energy storage products was lower than the revenue generated. Congratulations on that as well. Uh, Tesla noted it owns about 1.3 billion in digital currency. That's interesting. They didn't say um, Bitcoin versus Ethereum. Maybe they own some Ethereum too. 3.5% uh, of the company's automotive revenue or 354 million came from regulatory credits. Uh, sold to more polluting automakers. That's lower than uh, at any other time in the last four quarters. So incredible uh, quarter. Congratulations to the Tesla team. They've worked really hard. And the proof is in the pudding. The product's incredible. And people who own Teslas, I, you know, they, they tend to buy more Teslas over time. And the cars tend to last forever. And this doesn't even take into account, I think, the advances in self-driving they're making. Uh, from my understanding, the full self-driving stuff that I'm seeing on YouTube and people who are in the beta, I'm not in the beta, I haven't asked to be in the beta. But people with the beta are really starting to complete, you know, more and more complex drives without driver intervention. And it's growing really fast. So if you want to think about Tesla, it's really an energy company, the cars are about one piece of that stack, your home having solar and having a power pack mean that your house is the new electrical part of the electrical grid and it's the most important part it's like having a well at your land where you could pump up your own well water and be independent of the grid think how differently the world will look during global warming if we accomplish two tasks one we don't have these centralized power lines everywhere that can get blown over and cause fires that's why when we have wind in california northern california specifically 
they shut down the power grid preemptively because they know that sometimes a line will break because a tree will fall on or it'll just fly off and that starts to fire and then you have a wildfire. So in an abundance of caution, they turn off the power grid sometimes during high wind here. And so if each home has its own energy supply and is energy independent, that takes more and more load off of the overall grid, which means the grid um, is not going to be under duress and you might be able to sell your energy to your neighbors. And if things go offline and global warming, et cetera, we will have less um, peak demand because your batteries will kick in during the peak, let's say a really hot summer afternoon. If it's a hot summer afternoon and you have your own battery pack, then you are not straining the grid. When the grid gets strained, then it has to do more fossil fuels. So most of the grids are set up to, if you hit peak load, it starts burning coal. So it does all clean energy and renewables until such time it needs to hit uh, the dirty, uh, you know, fossil fuels is my understanding. And so that obviously puts CO2 into the environment. So we can nip this in the bud just by getting rid of the peak and smoothing it over. We should at some point just absolutely take an infrastructure bill like this, like the next time we do infrastructure, or we have a surplus in a place like California, we should just subsidize the heck out of solar to a, a ridiculous degree. We should mandate solar on every roof. We should mandate power walls or their, their equivalent. It doesn't have to come from Tesla. It can come from anywhere. But we should get more serious about it. Um, it. It's just a clear win. And obviously, all cars should be EVs, you know, by 2030 or 2040. And we should start retiring cars and taxing cars to get them off the road uh, and, and stop making them, right? And, th and this is where that tax credits. I know people, it's a trigger issue for some people or, or a triggering issue. Why should a big company that's doing so well get those credits? Well, they're getting those credits because other companies refuse to make EVs. You need to have a carrot and a stick. The carrot is Tesla getting rewarded for making these incredible cars and stopping the pollution of the environment. The stick is Volkswagen having the stick over their head that they have to improve their mileage and, and their, uh, you know, what's coming out of the back of those tailpipes emissions. And they actually lied about it. And the stick is what's pushed even Volkswagen into EVs. So carrots and sticks, eh, they kind of work and, and taxation is one of those things. And the transference of uh, capital from people who are burning fossil fuels to the people who are buying EVs, I think, entry level EVs, we should uh, make super cheap, give like a $10,000 tax credit on, you know, $50,000 and under uh, cars, just get them on the road. And all you know, city vehicles, etc. We should just get off the ice engine. I mean, it, it's time people we, I mean, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that cities are better to live in when there's less pollution. We saw it during the pandemic when everybody was locked down, you could see the stars again. That's the future we all want, right? I mean, we have that future. It's right there. We could just take it. Uh, and we could take it and, and create incentives to, to move people there quicker. Okay. And oh, and I'm going to get a cyber truck for sure. But I may get a Land Rover Defender in between, like I'm just maybe lease one for two or three years. Because I need a car to go in the snow, uh, like full wheel on the I want to I want to drive on beaches. I don't know why I feel like going for a drive on the beaches or in the snow. So tell me which four by four to get if you have any ideas. Um, okay, uh, we've been covering this tether stuff. They were investigated by the Department of Justice. We talked about that on the emergency pod that broke last night. But today, tether to USDC exchanges surpassed $300 million yesterday. So we saw this tweet and the Twitter user's name is State Common. He created a thread on the volume of tethers being swapped for USDC on Binance, a major crypto exchange. This is via coin market cap. According to these uh, reports, 300 million worth of tethers, the stablecoin were exchanged for USDCs. USDCs are circle stablecoin. Circle is going public. Jeremy Lair is coming on this podcast. They're highly regulated. They've got a lot. They seem to have a better, much better balance sheet and much better disclosure than Tether on their holdings. Um, some people still want to see uh, what the commercial paper is. and But their commercial paper was very tiny uh, at Circle when compared to Tethers. So this is if there's 60, you know, 600 million Tethers would be 1% of the 60 billion. So this is about half a percent, 50 basis points in just this one day in transactions. I mean, if every day, 300 millions worth of tethers, or even 100 million worth of tethers move over to USDC or to Bitcoin or to Ethereum, and people get out of tether, 
I mean, I think we might see Tether go from whatever it peaked at $64 billion in market cap. I mean, it should go down to 6 billion. It should just absolutely get wiped out because who would ever keep their money in a stable coin that's under investigation for bank fraud? That makes no sense. That would be like you had a bunch of Venezuela dollars, you know, during the revolution, and it was very clear that they were going to be printing more money and it was going to be worth nothing. And you had the opportunity to transfer it into dollars and you didn't or euros and you didn't. You'd have to be an absolute moron to hold tethers right now. I mean, just with all their lack of disclosure with the DOJ investigation on top of the New York Attorney General's investigation. I think we're going to see, you know, a major trend here. Now, tethers market is market cap. <laughs> it's pretty good. Pretty good. one. Tethers total market cap. Frightened slip there. When I said crap. The total mark, wait, we're just going to call it market <laughs> from now on. Tether's total market <laughs> has decreased by 100 million since last week, going from 61.9 billion to 61.8 billion, according to the sites that track this stuff. Who knows if it's even true? And that is the problem. Who knows if the which of those tethers is, you know, actually in circulation and who owns them and if they're backed by a dollar. It's just so crazy. So um, it's possible that Tether has to burn some of these tokens is my understanding when they get retired. Who knows, but I would just my message to people who are in the crypto space. You know, just get your crypto off of these offshore exchanges and put them in cold storage, get them onto a safer location than an exchange that could go away or get seized. I think the great seizure uh, is coming just like we saw China basically say, you know what, cryptocurrency is not for China. Bitcoin, you're out. N no mas. They just canceled it. It's quite possible you'll see that with these offshore exchanges. And certainly it's not looking good for Tether. So protect your money, folks. Do not be the bag holder. Get out now is my best advice. Um, it, you know, literally, I would say the same thing to people who own Nikola. And I actually did say that to them. Like, if you know, they're under investigation, if you know, the CEO is a dope and has left the company and is under investigation and all these Fugazi transactions, like there's other places to put your money. If there wasn't another location to put your money, sure, we could talk about like, is this the best of the worst options? But we're living in a world where you could own shares in Amazon, or Tesla, you know, or Robinhood and Uber, my two favorites, two of my biggest holdings, where you could invest in startups, you could buy a a nice balanced low fee Vanguard fund. There's so many places for you to put your money. Why on earth would you put all your money into something so volatile and crazy and under investigation? You have to be a maniac. All right. Speaking of pump and dumps and craziness in crypto, there is an app called Telegram where there's a lot of group activity. Telegram is like Signal or WhatsApp. It's a messaging app. But Telegram seems to specialize in having groups. And these groups uh, can be broadcast or discussion groups. And there is a uh, group that is called Crypto Binance Trading Signals and Pumps. And it's got over 3 million members as of today, down from 3.2 million last week. Not sure why that went down. Um, and here's their bio. We offer to provide best possible signals by our expert technical analysis team. But if in case any trade goes wrong due to market fluctuations, then we will not be responsible for it. That's all one sentence, folks, and obviously not a well written sentence at all. But they uh, were talking this past weekend of doing a big pump and we thought we'd watch it and see what happened. Um, they're branded with Bitcoin as their avatar, but it mostly pumps altcoins, it seems that trade on Binance, and they do one pump every two weeks, it seems the group admin is uh, basically the way it works is they pick a date, they tell you to be ready to buy to have your tethers or cash on your offshore exchange to be ready to buy what they call in the industry a coin, um, which is a coin that has very little value, they count down to the pump. Uh, they post a couple of memes and then some general crypto updates in there. So on July 25th, the group's admins focus was the token DREP, D-R-E-P, a small crypto project that helps facilitate transactions across blockchains, whatever that word salad means. Again, this is why they call them ish coins, because they tend to be full of ish. The total market cap for all DREP tokens is currently 20 million according to coin market cap. Uh, this, the, the week prior to the pump, it was trading at 50 cents or so. The pump then was scheduled for 1 p.m. Eastern time uh, when the DREP was trading at about 72 cents on Binance. 
building to the pump admins did take a minute by minute countdown then as soon as it hit 1 p.m the admins announced uh that they were the target and they were mildly successful the pump lasted five minutes and they increased the coins value to 97 cents so if insiders who ran this pump and up scheme were you know bought in at 50 cents or maybe they bought in years ago at a penny or a year ago who knows when they got in uh or if they're insiders on this drip project the volume during those 15 minutes was nine million dollars a quarter of the total supply which is more than 45 times the median 15 minute trading volume so they did successfully pump it uh, of course it comes crashing right back down <laughs> and uh we bring this up because uh it's really interesting to know of but one of these this is a public group that does pump and dumps and you're probably saying to yourself, is this legal or not legal? It's obviously illegal to do this with stocks, insider trading, market manipulation in crypto, eh, offshore, who knows, you know, who's responsible, ultimately for this. But the point I would like to make here is if there are public ones of these going on, with a bunch of idiots doing an ish coin, what do you think has been happening the last decade of crypto with the whales inside of a project like Bitcoin, or Ethereum, or XRP? You can be sure there are secret telegram rooms or WhatsApp groups where the big whales are hanging out and doing similar type of market manipulation. It would be an, a, right. It would be a certainty that there are people coordinating other types of pump and dumps. And so be careful. This is but one group. And we just do it to illustrate that there are coordinated groups of people pumping and dumping this stuff. And you, if you're not part of a pumping and dumping scam in crypto, Mm, maybe you're the sucker at the table. Maybe you're the person buying it at 97 cents. and You just don't realize it. Um, it's really in a system with no rules. Buyer beware. Be careful out there, folks. Okay, uh, it's been a great show. If you have feedback on our news programs, let us know if you have a news story you want us to cover just, you know, at TWI startups at Jason on Twitter. I'm taking a little Twitter break to focus on this in the new book, uh, which is going well. Thank you for asking. And we'll see you all next time on this week in startups. Bye bye. <laughs>